uh, the challenges and opportunities for economists in interdisciplinary research on human natural systems. Um, let me give you a bit of background on how this uh, work uh, came to be. Two years ago, I organized um, a session at the World Congress of Environmental Resource Economists in Gothenburg. And the idea was to have several papers in the session that had similar kinds of uh, projects that were sort of landscape scale, interdisciplinary, human natural systems kinds of studies. And so I got Eli Fenichel and Elena Irwin to present uh, their work um, as well as myself presenting work from Willamette Water 2100. And, um, you know, the idea was, was both to present three papers that, that had some similarity in terms of that, that kind of study, but also um, the emphasis was on presenting this work, but then also commenting on um, uh, doing this kind of work, some of the challenges, some of the issues that come up. And as we, in the weeks before the conference, Elena and Eli and I had a lot of exchange by email because I had asked each of us, each, I'd asked them to um, include in their presentation some comments on doing this kind of work and, and what it, uh, you know, advice they might offer or challenges they ran into. And not surprisingly, um, we found there were a lot of things that each of us was saying that resonated with the others in terms of challenges and difficulties. And um, the, the, the session went really well. There was a lot of interest. There were a lot of comments and questions uh, and follow-up, especially about these challenges of doing this kind of research, of working in an inter, inter, on an interdisciplinary team and trying to do it well, and some of the difficulties that were um, encountered along that way. Now, actually, four years prior, I had organized a similar session at the previous World Congress in Istanbul, and uh, Ian Bateman and Kathy Kling um, presented alongside of myself, and Andrew Plantingo was a co-author and co-presenter with me. Um, and so after the, the Gothenburg conference, we were talking about this and uh, came up with the idea, you know, we should really write a paper. It seems like there's a lot of interest and a lot of questions and a lot of issues, not just from these two sessions and these three papers, but, but things that all of us have been hearing and encountering for many years in many contexts where we um, interact with people in other disciplines. So um, that was the... Uh, so then we proposed um, a paper uh, on this topic uh, to REAP, uh, the Review of Environmental Economics and Policy, and so we, it was commissioned and for, so we're, um, we're trying to, uh, it, it's been a long time coming and we've had some uh, periods where it, it kind of sat on the back burner, but we're trying to, I'm trying to move things forward. And so um, the idea, the aim of the paper um, so here's a bit of an outline of what I want to talk about today. Um, you know, the, the aim of the paper is to write something that will have some value added, that it will be beneficial and contribute to better research projects of this kind. Um, it, it's, I, I think the, the, uh, the premise is that this kind of research is increasingly important for, address, for addressing environmental issues. Um, that it's difficult to do well, um, and that there's an undersupply of high quality research of this kind, and that the average quality of this kind of research may be low, and there may be a, a higher proportion of projects that sort of uh, don't really achieve what they were setting out um, to achieve. Um, and and some of the character, and, and and so that can discourage people from wanting to get. In, involved in this kind of research, which can maybe reinforce some of the perceptions of the research. And there can be kind of an adverse selection phenomenon going on there, which I'm gonna come back to later. Um, so I'm gonna talk about four possible issues to address. It seems to me that we've, we've sort of circled around these. I didn't actually identify or separate the four out that well until recently. 
Um, and then um, we develop a conceptual framework. I'm going to spend most of my time today going through a, the conceptual framework because to me, that's something that in, I, I think in the last six months or so we have um, <clears throat> that, that has sort of uh, become more fully developed and I think has helped uh, shed light on some, some things that uh, previously were sort of puzzling and confusing. And Elena Irwin and I have had a number of uh, conversations and email exchanges on, on that. Um, I'm going to try to turn to the question of supportive evidence of this of sort of the conceptual framework and what we think it, it leads to. And I think it leads to some preliminary conclusions and recommendations. Let me say this is a, you know, very much a work in progress. Um, it's, uh, it needs to get pulled together um, this summer. Um, and so uh, some parts of it are more well-developed than, other, than others. I'm really interested in your thoughts and feedback as I, as I go through this. Um, so that's where Um, that's where we're headed. So four possible directions or four aspects, it seems to me, they're the, the, the parts of this paper. And we actually, we're going to include, we do include in some of the draft portions of the paper, um, each of these, but I, I want to separate them out and then, and then focus on the last one. So the first possible direction of a paper like this could be sort of team science or best practices. How should you do collaborative interdisciplinary work and how to do it well? And there's some literature on what's called team science. Um, and we can think of best practices. A fair amount of this is about, you know, um, how to work well with people, how to communicate, mutual respect, trust, um, th those kinds of things, which are really important uh, and we can all um, be usefully reminded of the importance of those things. I, I found some of the, it, well, some of the team science literature is not necessarily crossing the boundary between natural science and social science. It's, it's sprung up in sort of uh, in, in medicine. And so different specialists in natural, different uh, physiological sciences, um, uh, have, have written on this. And there's uh, one reference in the next slide uh, refers to that. Uh, the second, uh, how to communicate with non-economists about economics. So this is more focused and more specific to economics. And this is, I think, a huge one in terms of this particular kind of research, because I think there are these very large challenges and barriers um, and it's, it's to some degree, it's, it's symmetrical that is, people in different disciplines need to do better to understand um, how others look at the world, people on in other disciplines, and especially across the natural science, social science divide. But I think there's also some asymmetry there in terms of the way that economists in particular are, um, uh, economics is not understood the way that we would like economics um, to be understood. Um, a third direction is uh, survey evidence of um, how this kind of interdisciplinary research is viewed by researchers, both in economics and in the natural sciences. Um, some of you may know we did a survey last fall, and uh, I think probably some of you participated in that. Um, and and so, so we have some survey results and research about, you know, attitudes toward doing this kind of research. And um, that will be a part of, of this paper. I, it, it looks, clearly like there's going to be another separate paper that, that goes into much more detail on that survey result, survey work. Um, the fourth part here, the conceptual framework, where we're using economic models to try and understand the, the well, I guess the generic term market failures in the production of this kind of interdisciplinary research. And so that's where I'm gonna focus a lot of my attention and um, I'm gonna take you through that in just a minute. So just to acknowledge some literature, um, there is a fair amount of literature on interdis interdisciplinary research. I've found some of it more useful than others. Um, 
Uh, the one at the bottom, Pulaski and Segerson, is, um, is you know, directly relevant to this kind of research and is useful. The one above it, the Natural Re National Research Council, is the team science, uh, one of the team science documents out there that I, th I found less useful for the particular issues that, that we're trying to address. Um, the one above that by Mansilla et al. is a really, it's a really good summary of some of the issues of quality assessment in interdisciplinary research, which is something that I'm, we're going to come back to because that's that's critical to the to I think the the con, in the conceptual framework that I'm going to that I'm going to be laying out. So let me get into the conceptual framework. Um, we're looking at research as a production function. Um, research produces a public good, knowledge. Um, the output quality is highly heterogeneous and difficult to measure. Um, the value of information in that process is uncertain in terms of its quality and usefulness, in terms of inputs and outputs and how we generate research. <clears throat> and this diagram is, is basically intended to recognize that there are a set of structures and organizations needed to produce this kind of public good. It's not one provided directly by government. We don't do, um, there's, a, there's a combination, there's, there's government, there's research funding through government, which you might expect with public good, but how we identify research questions, where the, coming, where the funding is, is coming from and how it's allocated, how research teams are formed, um, how research teams to make decisions internally to um, uh, to decide how to go how to go about doing their research, um, identification, prioritization, interpretation of research results, and then peer review and publication and dissemination and citation and impact. So we produce a public good. We have organizations at various levels uh, represented in this diagram. You can compare it to, oh, I don't know, Major League Baseball, where you've got teams and team owners and Little League and Minor League Baseball and um, <clears throat> all those structures uh, are meant to work together to produce high quality public good, uh, symphony orchestra, Major League Baseball. Um, here we see structures, universities, departments, disciplines, that all play a role in the production of this um, of, of research. And so that's sort of a, a general uh, framework. Um, so, so now I'm gonna develop this conceptual framework in the following way. I'm going to lay out a set of assumptions. I use the letter A for assumptions. Then there are some implications, I guess. I use the letter M for implications and then a, set, a few propositions. And so these are building blocks toward um, a kind of a conceptual model. It's not gonna be a mathematical model, but a conceptual model that, um, that, that we think helps identify some of the issues and some of the problems and challenges um, for uh, interdisciplinary research, especially interdisciplinary research um, involving um, um, human and natural systems, interdisciplinary research uh, of that type. So I think the first three points here, A1, A2, and A3, I've already mentioned this production process of a public good knowledge. The fourth one, high productivity and research quantity and quality require a supportive infrastructure of organizations. Okay, I've, I've, I've already said all four of those. Um, so the, there, are, there are sort of two key contributions in the, it liter, in the literature that, that many of you are familiar with that we rely on. Um, the first one here is Ken Arrow's Limits of Organization, which um, is one of my favorite books or booklets. It's, it's based on four lectures um, that he gave. Um, and, and I find it to be um, extremely valuable in lots of contexts. Um, so in this context, I'm going to, I'm going to sort of talk through these and there are a bunch more. So, um, th this is going to, we're going to build, a, a, a sort of a, a conceptual model here. So 
Assumption five, the value of information to a researcher varies depending on their investments in information structures, channels, and associated codes. So this is the terminology that Arrow uses for any kind of organization. But in research, you invest in a, the human capital investment in a particular discipline. You learn the literature, you learn certain codes and information channels where to, where to learn about the research in your field and to, um, to gain that information basis that you're gonna use. Information has increasing returns in use due to its public good nature. Okay, that's A6. A7, researchers are essential for judging research output quality. So here's something that makes this public good production function a little differently. The input, researchers are an input into production of knowledge. They are also critical to judging the quality the quality of research proposals, the quality of manuscripts for publication, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, a, there's that dual role here that is uh, less true in, in, in other production processes. Uh, A8, the information channels and codes in one discipline, discipline will be less useful to research in other disciplines. So this is, this is a key observation and, and the next slide is going to sort of reinforce this it may seem a little redundant, but it's, um, it's one that Arrow spends a lot of time on, and it's ones that as we sort of looked at this, these seem to be really important in getting at what we see, we think are key issues. Uh, so again, this is uh, drawing on uh, limits of organization. These are implications, I guess. M1, disciplinary lock-in. One, inherent irreversible capital once inherent in irreversible capital commitments to learning one's discipline have been made, it will be more efficient for researchers to keep using the same information channel rather than investing in new channels, even if expected value of the difference between the channels is large. M2, specialization. Individuals become more efficient in producing and communicating knowledge using their disciplinary information channels and codes due to economies of scale and scope. Researchers learn more in the direction of their specialization, whereas they are less productive acquiring and transmitting information outside their information channels and codes. M3 uniformity specialization leads to uniformity in information coding and knowledge at the discipline and organizational unit level. And here, I, I mean, we, there's a good a point to mention the historical perspective. Universities developed around disciplines and, and those disciplines are still very important. And there's, um, there's reasons in terms of these economies uh, for, for that, but it also creates a tension with the idea of interdisciplinary research. M4, proximity, costs of acquiring new information are not equal, lower costs to explore areas near to those already covered. Learning generalizes naturally and cheaply in some directions, much more difficult in others, especially areas quite different from one's own discipline. So in related natural sciences, even loosely related natural sciences, uh, researchers can branch out, but branching across that boundary between natural and social science is a whole different, uh, that's a, a huge leap. M5, collaboration within closely related disciplines disciplines is likely for individual researchers trained in a given discipline due to similarity of information structures, channels, and codes. Disciplinary efficiency, efficiency discipline-based units create tremendous efficiencies for generating and communicating knowledge and its value for the discipline, which can be assessed relatively easily relying on common knowledge structures, channels, and codes. I'm going to read that part one more time, which can its value, sorry, discipline-based units create tremendous efficiencies for generating and communicating knowledge and its value for the discipline, which can be assessed relatively easily, relying on common knowledge structures, channels, and codes. The cost of communicating across disciplines are high due to differences in codes, as well as limits to individuals' learning and information processing capacity. So people have limited brain capacity to learn other disciplines and to understand all the details and intricacies of the codes and processes, um, information channels there. 
Uh, M7, judging research quality. The advantages of and preferences for disciplinary proximity extend to researchers ability to judge the quality of research output that is in close proximity to their own and closely related areas. Now, um, specifically for interdisciplinary research, what I've set up that so far um, is sort of generally uh, a general, more general conceptual framework specifically for interdisciplinary research, M8, the cost of producing interdisciplinary research will generally be higher than for disciplinary research. The cost of evaluation of interdisciplinary research will be higher and disciplinary standards and procedures will not, um, will not suffice. Under supply of researchers willing to engage in interdisciplinary research is due in part to these expected high costs and low professional war, uh, rewards um, that accrue within their, um, within their disciplines. So, um, so that's maybe a lot. If there are questions, I can stop here. There, there are five more, um, uh, I guess these are propositions that bring us into the, um, that bring in George Akloff's uh, market for lemons and, and um, uh, you know, asymmetric information. Not hearing any questions. I'll move to this slide, which is the last slide with these sort of premises in assumptions, implications and propositions. So uh, most of you are familiar with George Akolov's uh, paper and analysis on the market for lemons. We see a strong uh, analogy or application of those concepts in this context. P1, asymmetric information across the natural science to social science divide results in reluctance and avoidance, uh, reduces collaboration between uh, between the two, just not knowing um, those other disciplines, not knowing how to judge the quality of uh, the work, the literature, the individuals um, is, um, is an obstacle. P2, asymmetric information can lead to adverse selection in research on human natural systems resulting in market segmentation. And so similar to the, the, the used car market where there's some segmentation and you get a, a, a market for uh, used cars that um, attracts low quality, um, uh, low quality vehicles um, more so than the average quality of say a one year old vehicle. Um, in research, there can be market segmentations and we're thinking in terms of across different uh, journals, different, uh, um, different research uh, projects and activities that will lead to this kind of segmentation across um, uh, uh, for this kind of research. Market P3, market segmentation in this setting can involve asymmetric quality controls with relatively high standards applied to only one side of the natural science, social science boundary. And the idea is you might, you, if you have a project where the initiators are natural scientists, they may focus more on having high quality in the natural science side and less, uh, um, uh, less attention to the quality on the human science, uh, behavior science side. Similarly, economists may focus more on the economic uh, quality and less on the ecology or the hydrology or whatever else is in the, the research modeling that they're doing. P4, this kind of market segmentation phenomena can reduce research quality, research impact, its social value, and its future funding. So you can get this self-reinforcing mechanism um, and across different disciplines, different journals, excuse me, um, 
research of varying qualities. Uh, this can happen, uh, as I said, both in, um, with higher quality social science, but relatively lower quality natural science and vice versa. Um, and the, the, you know, what's, what's making this, one of the, th what's making this possible is the very th strong difficulty of folks on one side of that divide to be able to judge the quality of what's being um, included on the other side. And that's in terms of the uh, teams of researchers, perhaps funders of research, and then um, also in, uh, in, um, in reviewing um, and, and publishing. Um, P5 market segmentation can have cumulative and spillover effects on researchers, disciplines, and university um, decisions. So one of the things that's interesting and distinguishes this from the applications in, of the sort of the George Akerlof markets for lemons literature is that there, and there is some, some literature sh suggesting that um, market segmentation can be a good thing looking um, in the context of a private, private markets where there may be different uh, demands for lower quality and higher quality um, products, similar products. Um, and that makes sense in this case, the, that, that conclusion doesn't hold, I would argue, because the, it's a public good and because if you have, um, a, if you have a, com, a, a research project where you're combining natural science and social science and one side of it is low quality, that lowers the overall or average quality of the research and that's likely to be more pro problematic. So that was a pretty quick uh, run through of a lot of um, elements of this conceptual model that we could, uh, that one could have spent, um, uh, could have gone into in more detail, uh, but I wanted to, um, to run through that fairly quickly. Um, and, and so one of the challenges, and this is where I'm hoping, um, I, I would be very appreciative of your thoughts and any advice you have, is that, is that as you can tell from what I've sort of laid out so far with this conceptual model, this is something that's very difficult to, to quantify, to study, to uh, provide empirical evidence for, but I'm convinced that it's a really important question, it's a really important problem, and so um, figuring out ways to bring evidence to bear uh, is, is, I think, one of, the, one of the challenges here. So we don't have a formal model or proof. We're not going to construct a math mathematical version of what I just laid out as, as a set of conceptual uh, premises or assumptions. Um, I think the important dimensions of these issues are very difficult to measure. We learned a lot from the survey we did last fall, but I don't think um, it, was, it was getting at the heart of what is going on here. Uh, there seems to be what I sort of described as the elephant sitting in the corner of the room. This was even something that occurs to me as I was reading some of the literature on team science and all the the articles and, and reports suggesting how you do interdisciplinary research and the importance of uh, communicating and, and trust and respect and all that, it, it, that all makes sense. But for those of us who have spent quite a few years and have had many opportunities to interact with folks in some of the natural sciences, engineering, and even other social sciences, there is just another set of obstacles that to some degree um, affect the ability of economists to collaborate with folks in other disciplines more so than the other way around and more so than say um, natural scientists and engineers or biologists and hydrologists. So how do how do how do bring evidence to bear on this? Well, I'm going to try to uh, um, show you a little bit of evidence and 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 then sketch out some recommendations and and uh, 
a, a couple of our tentative recommendations and then turn it over to, to some discussion. Uh, hey, Anecdotes Bill? can, yes. Bill, uh, just a quick question before we uh, uh, look at evidence. It looks like your, your motivation is very focused on cost. I just wanted to clarify kind of why you took that approach. When I think of out research output, uh, or it looks like you're looking at a, a kind of a one unit output of research, uh, some continuum of quality is, is what I heard from that. Uh, like a, like a, like consistent with the market of lem uh, the market for lemon. I, I just think, think about a motivation for interdisciplinary. Um, it seems like some of the rewards side, you mentioned rewards just in one, one piece, I think on one of the implications. Um, and uh, it seems like the rewards area uh, as a, like a revenue maximizing model is also relevant. It seems like um, a reward can be uh, tenure, a reward can be recognition by peers. Um, you know, I wonder about, are, are all researchers as happy to be famous in a different discipline and, and relatively obscure in their own? Um, or also impacts, if impact rather than quality of the research unit is key. Is there a motivation to move disciplines if you're moving closer to kind of an impact focus? You know, we see a lot of our colleagues moving toward machine learning. Some go to biology as a way to, I assume, to kind of maximize their impact on society. And so it seems like that's just sort of this differentiated output market. Did you think about outputs uh, outside of quality or, or those motivations or or is there a reason you just stuck to this kind of cost-centered approach? Um, yeah, that's that's um, yeah. I agree with with what you're saying there, and I think that is all part of a sort of a fuller picture of the research um, research production function. Um, if it sounded like I was focusing on cost, it's probably because I'm trying to I'm, I'm emphasizing in this sort of laying out of the conceptual framework, the, well, it's cost versus rewards. I think sort of uh, for individual researchers, it's very, the, I'm, I'm focusing on that, um, the obstacle, the cost of figuring out how to work productively with folks in other disciplines um, when those other disciplines are a whole different set of information channels and human capital investments. And so I, I'm, I, I think I'm focusing in on one aspect of it, but I'm not ignoring um, some of the, the, um, the elements that you're raising. I think those, those are part of the fuller picture that we'll, we'll, uh, we'll want to, um, we'll want to in include in the paper. May, I, I think when I get to several of the illustrations, you'll you'll see why I maybe focused a little too much on the on this um, this cost because it comes into play in, in uh, as an explanation for some of the evidence that I'm going to to suggest. So one of the ways that if this is sort of one internal part of uh, this bigger picture that that Robin was just describing, if one part of the um, of the market failure is reluctance to work with um, folks in other disciplines across, especially across the, the divide between natural and, and, and social sciences and, and economics in particular. What is the evidence that this is happening and, and how can we try to understand why? And I think I've ended up finding that some kind of um, case study illustration, bringing together large numbers, hopefully large numbers of examples and illustrations uh, help make that case. N not because I want our paper to lay out, um, you know, 20 examples or 20 case studies, but it's, it's helped me and it's helped uh, others try to 
figure out how to generalize what we're observing and what some of us, many of us have been observing, which is kind of that elephant in the corner of the room. And when, when I've talked about this topic with, with other economists over many years, and I bring up some of these issues of interdisciplinary research, it's often the case that the person I'm talking to starts telling me their own stories, their own anecdotes, their own case studies for why they have had all kinds of frustration and disappointments um, um, in, this, in this arena. So I've, I've sort of written up a bunch of case studies. Let me just point to um, three or four here to give you a sense of what I'm talking about. And I, I'm not, I, I wish there was a way to show you data, but I think some anecdotes building to some more generalizable um, observations um, can be useful. So the first one here, an eminent stream ecologist wanting to focus on the importance of public engagement relies heavily on what he thought was peer reviewed social science, but was an article by managers at a consulting firm writing a marketing piece in an online Stanford Business School journal. So, so th this is someone I've know, I know and have worked with, uh, really an, an, an eminent um, scholar in stream ecology, uh, was asked to, uh, as part of this, uh, uh, a very um, prestigious Baldy lecture. And this Baldy lecture published in a journal gets to the bottom line and he draws on this article and he, he didn't know that this was a marketing piece by a couple of managers from a consulting firm writing about sort of their own, uh, what, they, what, what they do as consultants. He thought he was um, citing um, uh, good social science research. He really wanted to emphasize how uh, participation, uh, public engagement was critical to doing a better job of, of stream restoration, stream conservation. So it was, you know, it was that problem of not, rec not knowing how to find the right uh, information channels and codes. The second one here, a group, of, a group of 10 or 20 atmospheric scientists determined to address climate change, start from scratch to construct models of global population growth, global income growth, poverty, rich country, poor country, carbon emissions, fertility, without ever bringing social scientists into the project. Their only reference to economics is to dismiss it, citing the Club of Rome and Her Herman Daly. Now, I became aware of this project because um, in a sort of infamous uh, guest speaker event at OSU many years ago, one of these uh, researchers came and presented this. It was a, a big deal kind of special lecture put on by CEOs, and it was a disaster because um, the seminar, the presentation of this work in progress uh, did not go over well. But the basic idea is, is that this is just one example and, and we could find many of researchers and I'm picking on natural scientists who don't, don't find a way to work with economists and social scientists. I know there are examples going the other direction and we will certainly include in our paper examples that go both ways where one side ignores or leaves out or doesn't adequately represent the other or try to work with researchers in that other field. But these are examples of where natural scientists primarily are, they know economics is out there, but they don't, um, they don't do it, they don't make the effort. So the third bullet point here, socio-hydrology, I'm going to give you a little more information. This is more general in the sense that a group of hydrologists have sort of created a new subfield in hydrology. A paper in 2012 includes the, this text, the science of people and water, a new science that is aimed at understanding the dynamics and co-evolution of coupled human water systems. The authors explain that natural scientists have for too long ignored the, human, ignored the human factor. Hydrologists are not exceptions to this. And that in sociohydrology, humans and their actions are considered part and parcel of water cycle dynamics. And the aim is to predict the dynamics of both. The authors explain that sociohydrology is concerned with analyzing the following why questions. What drives the system? 
for example, as a part of the international trade of food? What are the fluxes? What are the gradients? And can they be related? But quantity, qu quantity of water is not the only factor. Water quality may be equally or more important, in particular in water-rich countries. So what has, and this is not just one article, this began something that has grown and developed and has become a new sub-discipline within hydrology. And you can read this article or others that have come since, and there is almost no mention, uh, there are no citations really of economics literature, there are no co-authors who, who are economists, and it's become a large enough sub-discipline in hydrology that um, here's a, an editorial by Jim Hall, uh, editor of Water Resources Research, um, about a short uh, summary overview he wrote describing this very successful section on sociohydrology that they organized at the uh, AGU, the American Geophysical Union meetings, and had more than three ar th 30 articles. So what's to me, what's particularly dramatic about this example is that this subdiscipline is often running and growing just in the last eight years, and they are essentially recreating their own version of social science within um, to, uh, to be able to write papers um, only with really only with hydrologists as as um, as as authors as co-authors. Um, now there are other variations on this kind of go it alone um, research program, um, and again I'm focusing on the natural science side. I don't know if there are sort of organized versions on the on the economics or social science. Uh, on the economic side. Structured decision-making is another phrase that's used by a group. In fact, some folks um, here at, uh, in Corvallis, stakeholder engagement research design, trans transdisciplinary research, human dimensions research. These are all phrases that are used in versions of research wanting to look at human natural system, environmental issues, and but but avoiding working with um, disciplinary social scientists and perhaps economists in particular. And so, so that's maybe why in developing the conceptual model, I was emphasizing the cost because one of the ways to understand this is to say that it seems like it's viewed as just too costly to, um, to make the investment, to get to know and, and figure out which economist, should I work with an economist, which economist, what kind of economists, would they wanna work with me and how am I gonna go about doing this? Um, the last two bullet points here, the stay in your lane problem with, in collaborative projects, something that I know a lot of you are probably familiar with and I've talked with some of you about, um, there are, there does seem to be an asymmetry in that economists are, I think, more aware when they should, should not try to do hydrology or, or ecology or political science. But others um, in, some, in natural sciences and engineering and some other social sciences um, often get engage, engaged in doing things that we would see as, as um, economics, but, um, but not sort of uh, deferring to the economists on, on uh, questions. But by the way, in terms of the socio-hydrology, just I'm, I'm, I think you all know this, but water economics has been around for a very long time. There are hundreds of papers every year. The first paper, the lead paper in the first issue of the American Economic Review in, 1911 was on water. So, so the idea that sociohydrology would need to, would, would want to sort of begin to bring humans into um, their literature on uh, water is, um, is very surprising. So quickly, I'm, I'm running out of time. So let me, 
one of one of the things, one of the reactions that you may have is, well, aren't aren't these um, sort of second level activities by some researchers that are not high quality and not going to be published in high quality journals? Um, well, as I look at the number of papers being published, the top bullet there, human natural systems, socioecological systems, 600 growing over the last 20 years to 600 papers a year. But some of these other variants, human dimensions, transdisciplinary, sociohydrology, they add up to a significant number of papers and absorb a significant amount of research resources as well. Their publications are influence credibility of research. They, I think, are grow in, in, I think what's happening is they're, they are creating these alternative ways to bring socio and human activity into research without t making the effort, taking the time or making the investments to bring economics or other disciplinary social sciences to bear. And that, um, that, that I think uh, is a problem. Um, let me quickly turn to a couple of preliminary ideas about where we might end up in this paper. We're going to be saying something about team science. We're also going to be saying something about how to initiate an interdisciplinary project of this kind with a group of individuals from different disciplines and the importance of where you start in terms of thinking about taking a systems approach. And, and I'd be happy to talk about that more with folks, but I don't think there's time right now. One of the things that has, that has bothered me for quite a long time is we use the term peer review and we use it when we're talking about everything um, that's so-called peer reviewed. But when you have a paper that's that's focused on economic concepts and economic uh, aspects of human behavior, but it's written by a geographer and published in, in an ecological journal, probably reviewed by ecologists, how can we consider that to be peer reviewed? I think we need a more refined, um, higher, more detailed notion of, of what peer review is and what it should be. So one of the ideas here, you know, asymmetric information in this case doesn't have to be asymmetric. We can, we can in the publication process, we can provide more information. So if you had journals, if you encourage journals, if there was a way that journals began to include in articles published a note at the bottom next to the acknowledgements, this article was, reviewed by two economists, one hydrologist and an ecologist, and the uh, editor, editorial oversight was handled by, you know, a political scientist uh, and a marine biologist, you know, have, have the specific disciplinary expertise of the individuals who were responsible for reviewing and um, accepting for publication an article would get rid of, of some of the asymmetric information at very low cost. And I would think that would increase the credibility of, of journals where there is this problem of asymmetric uh, quality control across the two sides of the, of the divide. Having more reviewers, more carefully matched reviewers for journals and, and funding review panels with interdisciplinary research on human natural systems. I think this is certainly done to some degree already, uh, but perhaps uh, more is needed. Um, advice to economists, considering this is one of the things to include in a paper like this for, for young economists or economists have never done this before, advice on, on maybe how to think about getting in, involved in this kind of research. Um, I already said the fourth one, how to, how to begin a research project of this kind. And one coming back to institutions, Robin, I think you mentioned something about institutional structures. I think this is a big one. Uh, people, who, people who have done this kind of research for a long time have recognized that you need a long time period to get to know colleagues in other disciplines 
to know how to work well with them, for them to understand you, for you to understand them. And I've been struck by conversations with people at places like the Bren School and the Yale School of Forestry. At the Bren School, Andrew Plantinga is on, he, he's, part of his job is to be on promotion committees for folks in, you know, in hydrology, in, in ecology. In many of the things he is required to do in that Bren School, he is part of a multidisciplinary unit and he has to work with these people and get to know what they're doing, what their students need to do, hiring committees, promotion committees, repeated working, re repeated opportunities to work, to work with people and to get to know them, um, it seems to me is, um, is one of the ways that this kind of research, um, th that kind of institutional structure is needed to do this kind of research well. Okay, I'm stopping there. Just got a few minutes. Um, uh, I'd be happy to hear from, from you now or any kind of follow-up. If you'd be interested in looking at the draft manuscript um, and offering thoughts or comments or your own anecdotes, case studies, illustrations uh, along these lines, positive ones as well as negative ones. Um, I, I think more information about uh, these kind, these experiences can help inform um, what we think we want to say in this paper, and how confident we would be in in making certain kinds of statements. Oh, you're still there. Hey, Bill. Uh, can you hear me? This is David. Yes. Um, and apologies in advance if you already, I, I had to step away uh, briefly, um, uh, and if you already mentioned this, uh, my apologies, but um, there's there's an interesting issue unfolding right now where I think um, uh, the there's an explosion of economics research on COVID-19, right, and I'm not sure that's always very interdisciplinary, um, and I, I don't know if, are, are you planning on it, maybe in this follow-up publication touching on on the current situation and, and interdisciplinary inter, interdisciplinarity in that uh, area? Uh, that's an interesting thought. Actually, one of the reasons this paper has had less progress over the last few months than I was hoping is that Eli Fenichel, who had previously done work on social distancing and, and, uh, and the spread of, of uh, you know, of, of pandemics and this kind of thing, he was quickly uh, shifting gears and I think has actually published something in The Lancet with co-authors in, in, um, in other disciplines. So um, that's a great point. And when I can get his attention back, hopefully soon, um, bring that into, uh, into our work in this paper uh, might be something we've consider we had started off thinking we were going to focus on these sort of landscape models of of um, you know environmental landscape scale models of human natural systems but um, it it would be um, yeah that'd be that's something uh, certainly worth uh, thinking about so I'll, I'll make a note of that and, and see what he thinks I hadn't I hadn't thought of it, about it myself thanks Bill, um, Jeff here. Uh, hey, Jeff. So uh, I was just thinking, you know, often economists, we just ask different questions than, you know, people in other disciplines inherently. And, and so, you know, in my little experience, you know, uh, I've been interested in, for example, what, what is the size of a subsidy required to achieve some target that somebody wants? What's the size of, you know, some kind of policy parameter? People in other disciplines don't really seem to know anything about tariffs or taxes or subsidies or, you know, factor subsidies versus output subsidies and all the other so, sort of things. So that sort of thing, I don't know. What, how do you approach that, that they just simply ask maybe we maybe there is no way to 
do you have any thoughts on that issue? Just how we, what the, the questions we're interested in are very different typically. So, yeah, that's, that's a, um, I would say, and, and one of the, I have a couple more slides, but that, that sort of could relate to this, but I'm not going to bring them up. I, let me, I think most of these people in the natural sciences and, and, and a lot of, most of the examples I, I, um, describe the sociohydrology and the structured decision makers, these are people who, um, these are researchers who want to make a difference. They want to solve a problem. And, and they use, tend to use the word management rather than policy. But what you described is wanting to get at a policy question. What is the, what kind of policy might help address a particular problem? I, I think, I think what's, to me, what is one of the things that, that, that I want to put, including this paper, is the importance of starting from square one with a group of people who might be interested in looking at some issue in, a, in the context of, a, of a, a landscape or human natural system. To step way back, to, to, to sit down with folks in other disciplines, characterize the system that, that you want to um, study, recognize the most important components of the natural side of that system, recognize the most important components of the human part of that system, and relate those to a research question. And, and, and I think if you start from, from that sort of basic, here's a system, here are the components, what is the research question? How can we, how can our understanding of this system and the different disciplines that we represent lead to shedding light on how to address um, a management or policy question, how to, to solve a problem? And, and I, think, I think this may be one case where we quickly recognize and jump to, you know, policy instruments, but I would bet for a lot of these folks, it would take a long time to sit down and talk about that system and the different components and how they work together and where they work well, or in other cases don't work well, and how society might be able to intervene to change, make a change that would make a problem less severe and that you know, market-based incentives might be one part of that. But I, I, I'm, I, I think, um, I think in many cases, I'm thinking about the Willamette Water Project. It took a very long time to begin to understand how different folks on that team thought about that system, what they didn't understand about the way economists look at the parts of the human system, the markets or, or policy uh, options. And so, um, so, so maybe your question, um, I guess one response is that, is that it can take a long time to get to where you can talk with folks about a subsidy or a tax or, or, you know, that sort of level of detail in a policy intervention. Um, and, and they may be, by that time, they may be already heading off in a different direction and not really not really having absorbed much of what we want them to understand in kind of a big picture of, uh, of, of, of how, how we, our own mental model of how that human system functions and how we understand and how we can model it and how we can, you know, recognize processes in the human system the same way ecologists recognize processes in the natural system. And, and they don't, I think we may have some sense about how an ecologist can understand the feedbacks and, and uh, the ways that uh, um, an ecological system functions. I don't think they have a sense at all that we look at a human system very similarly. That was a long answer. Anybody else? Uh, Bill, this is um, Sahan. It was an um, interesting presentation. I just um, had a a thought that went through my mind, and which was that we have a comparative advantage as economists 
in thinking about and analyzing the social system and you know, the sort of the levers to pull them what's happening there, right? And, and I have this idea in my mind, which may be wrong, that when somebody else is trying to do that, it's going to be like a patchwork approach that's not coming from a systemic understanding of sort of, sort of a bottom-up derivation of what's going on, just like me trying to do some hydrology model and thinking, oh, it's this and that without actually having a proper training or sort of a way to think about the system. Um, and I'm wondering if, and I, I, I don't think I heard you use the word comparative advantage, but, but it, 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 that's true, right? I mean, and then I wonder if that's part of the way to try to think about this in that um, we have the tools and sort of a, a, a historical process that's you know, evolved over time and it keeps evolving, right? We have a lot more behavioral econ kind of uh, 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 tools that we might be relying on now compared to 20 years ago, but we do have sort of that strength and a competitive advantage in understanding and modeling the human system as it relates to these um, natural systems. And if a natural scientist is doing that, I'm, I'm assuming it's going to not be done at that system level. Um, and I'm just curious to see if that, if that falls into this. The other thought that went through my mind was, you know, even though the quality of papers might be low when, when you think about publications, um, we just had uh, something that got rejected from NSF, which was sort of a coupled human natural kind of a thing on water. But it made me think that if there's more and more people doing social hydrology stuff, then it may be that it becomes harder to actually get funding for things that may be more pure in, in your analysis, right? Because your, yeah. your evaluation committees are going to also get uh, broader and, and the, the disciplinary points they have gets uh, broader in that sense. Uh, but I, I was curious if you had thoughts on, on that. As well. Yeah, well, I think the possibility that sort of economics is being debased by these other versions of uh, social science models. I, I think there's. I, I think that's. Um, I think there's there's some of that happening. I've been asked to. I was asked to review a paper for a hydrology journal, and the social science part of it. They were. It was sort of a trying to do some kind of valuation and cost benefit analysis, and it was terrible. And I said it was terrible. The paper was published anyway because I was the lone voice who was saying this is this is not up to standards in economics. Um, so, but, but back to your other point, I think I think you're right on uh, target about yeah we we have we take a system approach to modeling the human system side. Ecology actually has a sort of a systems approach to to looking at the natural side, and those so so we, economics and ecology are are similar, and they're the only disciplines I I would say. That, that have, or at least for re relevant to this kind of work, um, that, that do kind of take a system. We have the advantage in that we also look at the whole, the combined system, and we step outside the system and think about um, social welfare functions and intervening in the system to make the system better for people. So that, I, I think, you know, it's always good to be humble, but but I think we do have a special uh, capacity in economics, normative economics, stepping outside, recognizing that not just sort of a, the, the um, a positive economics of how that human system works, but the normative economics of how could we make it work better? How can we um, bring information to bear on society's desire to make that whole system better? And, and we, I think, along the lines of what you were suggesting, could and should take a leading role. The, the first session I mentioned uh, six years ago in Istanbul, um, at the end of, we had a great discussion and Kathy Kling was up there. And at the end she said, you all should get involved in this kind of research and economists should be the PIs on these kinds of projects because of that vision, big picture that is part of our discipline. So I agree. Hi, Bill. I have a question or two, actually, about your first potential recommendation um, regarding peer-reviewed journals. One, do you know of any journals that already do something like that, lists the authors, qualifications, and disciplines? And then two, this seems like such a simple solution, obviously not a solution to the entire problem, but to, to help us get there. Why do you think it hasn't been implemented in journals before? Or do you think there's reasons why people wouldn't want it to be signaled? Yeah, that's a good question. I, there are certainly some journals who take very seriously the task of fitting 
reviewers to uh, manuscripts that are multidisciplinary. I, I called one, uh, uh, Gary Yoey is co-editor uh, of Climatic Change, and I talked with him um, a couple of months ago about this, uh, uh, in general, about their process and reviewing interdisciplinary. And, and they take it very seriously and have for a very long time. And, 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 uh, and you know, they look at the manuscript, they look at what disciplines are important, and they find reviewers to do it. And if it takes, if they need five or six reviewers, uh, I, I, I think they do that. I, I, this, this idea actually came up like the next morning I woke up after talking with him and thought, why not provide this information in the article, uh, you know, to, um, so that the viewer, the reader knows uh, the disciplinary expertise that was part of the review process. And I emailed Gary and I said, what about doing this? And he hadn't apparently thought of it before. And he said, that's a really interesting idea. I'll bring it up at our next editor's meeting. And I haven't heard back from him, but, but it was, the idea was new to him. Um, but it, it seems, it seems to me like it's something that should catch on. And you could imagine that if it caught on some journals, one would hope that it would catch on and be seen as journals who have nothing to hide being willing to um, state openly the disciplinary expertise that was used for reviews. And that would hopefully encourage other journals to uh, step up their game. Thank you. So it's, it's now 10 after one. Um, you can sneak out of the room. I'm happy to stay if others, <laughs> if there are other questions, but don't feel uh, don't feel obligated at this point. Thank you very much for listening. And again, if you have any follow-up thoughts or ideas, um, uh, please pass them along. Thanks, Bill. Sure. Bill, I'm uh, I'm going to ask a question. Okay. Uh, I don't want to I don't want to keep you though. You've you've got better stuff to do. No, no. I <laughs> uh, so it would be great if, if you had like, I would love to share like bullet point advice from this for early career faculty in economics. It's like, you know, like uh, sort of on long lines of your observations and your qualitative model. Um, is, is, this, is, is this something that you're you're working on or what is it you know already already in the paper for what do you think? um sorry which which are you referring to so just just sort of advice for early career well early career um economics and non-economists who are approaching projects like this for in particular for people early in their you know getting started as an assistant professor yeah i think we'll have a section in the paper um, that tries to, um, yeah, that tr tries to get at some of that advice um, and, and some, you know, positive things to do, ways to approach it, things to keep in mind. Also, maybe a couple of warning signs, things to, you know, be cautious about getting involved in. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I uh, actually all along, from, from fairly early on, we had in our outline uh, a sort of, I mean, part of it we call best practices, but I think we, we have talked about and thought about including that kind of advice because, um, yeah, I, it's the kind of thing you, after many years, you, um, you recognize things you would have done differently and invitations to participate in projects that you now know you should have just said no to. <laughs> Um, so yeah, definitely. Or opportunities you shouldn't have been so skeptical about maybe. And yeah. Passed up, you know, um. well, and, and I think there, one of the things would be ask to have a meeting, you know, if, if, if you're, if you're invited early on to consider a proposal or something, Ask to bring, ask to get together and sit down and start with a conversation of 
you know, a basic, let me, let me show you this slide briefly that um, I probably sh shared with some of you before. Um, so this is from a paper, just thinking of a simple, the sort of the simplest possible model. You've got the human system and the biological system a fishery, separate models, and then how to integrate them. But this is really just a, a, a you, you can think about how actually so there are so many dimensions to even just a fishery model um, to talk about, you know, the spatial extent, the temporal extent, the level of complexity, uh, the, the resolution of both sides of this. But then to say in general, okay, we're going we're gonna to think about a study of a system. Maybe start with a diagram or at least a, 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 start with this diagram and say, okay, which, let's talk about which parts of the human system and which parts of the natural system are essential for the research question you have in mind. And let's talk about that research question. Is it a good research question? Will studying uh, this system actually help us answer that question? Which parts of, of the human system and natural system models do we need are essential to addressing that research question? What parts will you um, be, be focused on? Wh which parts were you thinking you would be inviting me to be focused on? There's, and, and I, I'm sort of thinking of having this actually as a as an appendix or supplemental information, this diagram along with 20 questions that I think if, if a young researcher was asked to be involved in something and they, they you know, had a, a, a meeting and sat down with folks, looked at a diagram like this and talked through these 20 questions, you would come away, I think, with a pretty good idea of whether this is a project that you should pursue or one that you should run away from quickly. I think this is great. I, and I, I have one, one more quick question. Uh, and I promise I'm not, I promise I'm not, or maybe I am uh, more chatty than usual because of social isolation uh, and quarantine here. But uh, do you think, do you think that um, this, some of what you're talking about, you know, you don't, you don't think much about socio hydrology, right? Do you think it's coming from a place of uh, just, you know, a sense that economics ec hasn't been, you know, has chalked up a lot of high profile like failures recently or, or just sort of black eyes? I mean, there was perception that the discipline really blew it on the Great Recession, um, you know, and then recently we've had episodes where economists are trying to forecast uh you know uh covid-19 infections using excel polynomial fits i don't know if anybody saw that you know and and just kind of, you know it's it's coming from a place of you know a perception that we don't really have bragging rights for being the most successful sort of premier framework for understanding human behavior with respect to water, let's say. I mean, is that, is that an element here or is, it, or is there another explanation? Well, I think there are many elements. I think that's, I, I think you make a good point. I think sort of anti-science politics is part of it. Um, I think the, you know, in, in the realm, in, in under the category of misunderstanding about economics, um, Folks who hear, you know, some of the examples you gave about macroeconomics, and does that uh, reflect poorly on uh, microeconomists trying to build models of of watersheds, potentially? I, I, my sense is that the more, um, aside from uh, aside from just not understanding or not knowing what economics is and seeing it as a, a huge obstacle to figure out how to learn more or collaborate. There is an anti-economics bias um, uh, among some and it's quite explicit. Uh, one of the 
illustrate examples I, I wrote up. I mean, so some of you have, have seen this. Um, there's a YouTube video of a guy that I'm now on an advisory board with. And, and he and I were talking about team science and, and he said he'd done some work on it and written. And I, and I found a YouTube um, a video of his keynote address to a, a, a society of oceanographers or something. And, and he talked about team science and the importance of trust and mutual respect and, and, and not, make, not making statements outside your own discipline. And then he went on to wax eloquently about psychology and politics and then he got around to economics and he dismissed economics because you can't put a value on nature. So the, 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 the number, the, the so the, the, the I, I don't know what the proportions are, but some of the aversion to working with economists does come from either a biased perception of a, a, a a perception that economics is biased against uh, the environment, which may actually be the perception of a bias because they themselves are strong uh, advocates. I mean, conservation biology is a, is a discipline that is by its title uh, invoking advocacy to conserve biology. So, and, and, and biologists and ecologists have actually in recent years um, had more of a debate within their own discipline about whether they should be advocating or not. You know, most, dis most scientific research, uh, our discipline included, it's pretty clear that we should be neutral. We, our research should be objective and neutral and we should do as much as we can to not let our own personal preferences influence our research. And, and some of the ecologists are not so sure and think that uh, they need to to get in the game more. So, so whether whether they, I mean, I'm sure th there is bias in economics. There's perception, I think, of bias. There are still people who seem to earn um, get a lot of attention because they still refer to what economists said in the 1950s and what Herman Daly said, and other sort of um, sort of the, the certain portion of the ecological economics group. Um, so yeah, so, so I, I guess I, I, my answer would be, I think there are multiple dimensions to the challenges we face. And, and, and I, don't, I don't know, I'm not sure where that leads in terms of, of, of uh, addressing it, but getting to know individual researchers so that they get to know you so that you have many conversations with them and they begin to understand how you look at the world it seems to me to be the best and perhaps most important way to overcome some of those um, mis misunderstandings great advice that i i hope uh you, you're able to to share widely you know with in particular with people just starting out with this stuff Bill, thanks for your time here. Um, I'll try to be quick. Um, I'm wondering if you see a distinction between economics as a discipline and operations research, and if you think other uh, disciplines might, uh, you know, outside of economics might incorrectly conflate the two, uh, if, if that makes sense. Sorry, I missed the last part. If you think other disciplines uh, outside of the social sciences might conflate the two. Might be might be inc incorrectly conflating the two, uh, oh, uh, lumping them together be, as maybe one and the same. If, oh, might be conflating economics and operations research? Yeah, or if maybe that's a false distinction. No, well, um, boy, um, thanks for raising that question. There are, um, <laughs> there are, I, I think we could come up with five or 10 ways that um, economics is misconstrued or misunderstood. Understood. Some folks think economics is accounting. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers, you know, uh, that the, the economists are brought in to tally up the cost of building a dam and, and, and that's sort of all they understand economics to be about. Uh, some people, you know, think it's about markets and finance and that's all economists value. There are things that are sold and exchanged in, in markets. Um, 
you know, the operations research, you're suggesting there might be a stigma there. I, I'm not, sh I, I'm, I'm not, I haven't thought about that much. So, so, um, so maybe that is an, another dimension. Um, you know, people confuse sort of social science economics with business school economics. Uh, the distinction being, to me, the distinction being business school economics is tools to help you and your firm uh, succeed and be profitable. Social science economics is, you know, the broad, to me, the broadest of the behavioral sciences and uh, uh, representing our ability to think about choices and incentives and, and behavior in ways that overlap a lot with psychology and political science and sociology and, and others, but, but more, uh, I, I guess, to the extent that operations research um, would bring to mind, you know, computer models as opposed to philosophical questions about people's well-being, that may be an issue. I see, thank you. Sure. Anybody else? Good talk, Bill. Thanks, Steve. Excellent. Good Excellent. to see you. Thank you, Bill. Good to see you all. Uh, thanks for your time and uh, have a good one. We've got one, we've got another one next week. Christian. Great. Yeah, thanks for relaunching the Brown Bag series virtually. You're the pioneer, so. All right. See ya. Bye.